Right, morning, guys. Okay, so early start. Thanks very much for coming in this at this time. Um, we're going to push off today with uh, Learning Unit 5 in the theory book, which is uh, social implications. Um, it's actually quite weird, this, because I did this exact same uh, lecture yesterday for the grade 10s. So it looks like we're almost in uh, lockstep here with them, with them and us. Um, okay, so... Once again, this is very much just a, um, everything we need to know is kind of here in the, in the book. Uh, we can all read. Um, I'm just gonna kind of just expand on a couple of um, points that I think uh, that I have seen come up before, obviously in tests, I'll tell you which ones those are. Um, and you, you can just uh, read it all for yourself and, and obviously just make your own notes as per usual. Okay, so social implications, uh, 5.1 are all about, um, reducing the impact of the use of computers. Obviously, the use of computers, there are some uh, negative side effects to that. Um, and obviously, one of the biggest one of those is waste. Um, and, and as you can imagine, um, electronic equipment nowadays is getting churned out at a, um, at a frightening rate. It seems, there seems to be a new version of a phone coming out all the time, and then you have to wonder what happens to all the old phones. Um, I must admit, I myself, I'm not an upgrader just for the sake of upgrading. Um, something has to offer me some serious, serious benefit, um, especially when it comes to software. Um, I don't just upgrade to the latest version of software all the time, simply because um, new software wants new hardware. You know, so over time, people keep saying, oh, my computer's getting slow, my computer's getting slow. And no, it's not. Your, your computer's as fast um, on the last day you own it as it was on the first day you owned it. And what happened was you just kept putting on newer software that wanted more power. So it, the software just kept slowing your computer down. That's what the problem was. And so I'm not a big fan. I don't upgrade to the latest version of Word and Excel and that because I know I don't even use 1% of the current version of Word. I don't even use 1% of that. So, so, um, so e-waste is a big, big problem. Um, one of the biggest problems with... Um, with e-waste, well, there's two problems, really. It's, there's a big problem with um, the plastics, you know, the, obviously the actual bits and pieces. Um, and as we know, that plastics are, is, a, is a big, big problem nowadays. Um, but one of, the, one of the biggest problems, of course, is the battery. Um, you had, uh, lo lo most of these batteries are containing uh, some sort of heavy metal, um, usually lithium, if they're lithium ion batteries. <laughs> Um, or nickel if they've uh, nickel metal hard drive batteries. So disposal of the batteries is always a, a big, big problem. Um, the other thing as well with e-waste is always just printing, the use of unnecessary use of just of paper. Um, and then I, I know they've put in here the detrimental effects of mobile radiation. I don't know. I, I myself, I'm, I'm of the school that believes that's crap. Um, I don't think that my mobile phone is frying my brain. Um, the level of radiation is just so low um, that I, I really don't think it's having any sort of um, harmful effect. And, and a lot of people are blaming um, <clears throat> cell towers and cell phone communications for, for all the bees that are disappearing. And then that's, I think as well, I think is an old wives tale. Um, I think now they've, they've firmly established that that's not the case. That's not why bees are disappearing. Um, bees are disappearing because of some sickness um, that, that, is, that they have no um, defense against. And that's just um, wiping them out. So I, 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 my, that's my personal belief. I don't think that radiation from cell phones is, is a big issue. I think it's an, an old wives tale. Okay, so then they obviously they talk about thinking twice before you buy, you know, does the new thing really offer you anything more than the old thing you've got? How are you going to get rid of it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, 5.2, keeping informed. Nowadays, very, very easy. Okay, they taught some of the notes they put in the book here, RSS feeds, that's old technology. Now, when I say old, it's 10 years ago. Um, RSS feeds were the big thing when blogs started coming in. All blogs had sort of an RSS feed. RSS meaning real simple syndication, um, a very easy way for you to see. You were just 
you would subscribe to that feed with your with your browser and you would be able to see um, if new things were posted without going to the website. You would see the headlines of the blog posts. Um, and they talk about following reputable people and TED Talks, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can read through that, but I think a lot of it is sort of older. The big trick is just to just to read. You know, just there, there, there's, I mean, I live on YouTube. YouTube, believe it or not, it's the second largest search engine in the world now, straight behind Google. Um, and you can pretty much find anything you want on there. Um, obviously, you need to curate the stuff you're consuming. Um, there is, uh, you know, fake news is the big thing nowadays. Just just be careful that you're not listening to some some right wing wackadoodle, um, and or, and and on the other hand, some left wing nut job as well. So you obviously, just curate what you what you're consuming, um, and just use make up your own mind. Okay, don't don't subscribe to all that some of the trash that goes around, especially on social media. Okay, obtaining product upgrades. Um, you want to do that, especially for like Windows critical updates coming out, patch Tuesday once a month. Um, make sure you're upgrading your your operating system. Um, nowadays, if you if you left it turned on, and if you're on, if you're as long as you and and you're on a Wi-Fi connection, it will uh, normally they will update automatically. Um, apps as well as your operating system. Um, nowadays, will determine it's 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 um, it can do so. Uh, if you're on a paid data connection, then it, it usually won't. Okay, you would have to tell it to you. But you definitely want the critical updates. The critical updates are fixing issues um, that crims are are making active use of to hack into machines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, computer crimes. They start talking about computer crimes here um, and different types of computer uh, criminals. Obviously, hackers and crackers. We kind of know what they are, and they got, they're the guys that are sort of looking for vulnerabilities in websites and web servers, or even in your machine. Like I said, if you don't do the upgrades, um, like for instance, um, um, Flash was a, 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 a very common vector for attack. Um, obviously, because once again, uh, Crims got into Adobe's website. They stole the um, they stole the source code for for Flash, and so because they had the source code, they could find all the weaknesses in the software. And for years, they've been exploiting that um, and and getting into your machine. Um, they talk about white hat hackers, black hat hackers. Um, white hat hackers are normally guys that will hack a website. Um, and then they will contact the company and say, oh, we, we managed to break into your website this in this and this manner, um, and you better fix it. They don't do anything. They just do it for the sport, really, or money. And nowadays, they're, the, they're what they call bug bounties. Um, Google run them. Microsoft run them. Um, and if you can exploit a website, they will pay you. Some of them are substantial. Since you, you, I mean, I see reports of uh, guys getting seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars for for one for one bug. You know, so it's quite a. If you can find them, it, it's quite lucrative. Uh, cyber gangs—that's a huge thing nowadays. Um, stealing of information, um, or basically just online extortion. Okay, so they will they, they will send you a. An email that's got they, they've worked out a whole lot of stuff about you, and it looks shady, but they, they've really they've got it from your social media accounts, um, and they'll send you this like email that says, "Oh, they've got video of you sort of through your webcam and compromising position. Um, you better pay them a bitcoin or something like that, or they're going to send it to all your friends, and, and they miraculously know who all your friends are, obviously because they've just checked on your Facebook." Your social media accounts and um, who's following you, et cetera, et cetera. So don't pay that any heed. Just if you get them, just toss them away. Um, the other thing is they will encrypt your machine. That's that's a gnarly thing. Okay, they will they they they've got some um, <clears throat> gnarly software that will that will um, malware that will literally encrypt your machine, everything. Um, and unless you pay them a certain amount of money. They won't give you the key to unencrypt it. So then your decision is basically, what's your information worth on your laptop? Now, is it worth paying them whatever they're asking? Um, or do you just say goodbye information? You say, too bad, so sad. Um, I'm going to reformat my hard drive and start from scratch again. Um, I think most home users would probably do that. If you're a business and all your business stuff is gone, you know, a different kettle of fish. 
tough decision that you'd have to make sort of right there and then. Um, virus authors, obviously, they've they've studied to see why do some of these people do this? Um, why do they make these things? More often than not, it's just a pat on the back. You know, it's just these these guys that are just trying to see who can who can make sort of the most destructive software. <laughs> and don't don't confuse proper proper hackers and that with uh, what they call script kiddies. Script kiddies is somebody who just goes and downloads somebody else's um, malware off a server somewhere um, and then starts using it. They, they've they got no intelligence other than how to download something. So they, they're not the real clever guys. They, they're just the guy. They're just the, you know, the peons in the guy's army. Uh, and they talk about the effect of cyber crimes, obviously loss of money, um, loss of information, um, loss of sort of uh, intellectual property from your business, somebody steals your plans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's obviously the different effects of cyber crimes. Um, types of computer crimes, hardware theft, obviously they can just steal your computer, break into your office and steal your stuff, steal your phone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or there's software theft. Software theft can be in various different ways. Uh, it could be from usually from piracy, um, where you've you, you go and get a crack for some game or something because you don't want to buy it. Um, hey, no judgment, I've done it myself. Um, software, I think if they made it cheaper, they'd get a lot more people buying it. Um, once again, that's just my personal belief. <laughs> okay, I'm not the guy who sets the prices. Um, but I'm obviously, you know, I'm not the only one who thinks like that. Otherwise, there would be no nobody would be making cracks available. Um, copying, obviously, people just copy software and distribute it. Um, a question that you will often see coming up in exams is to do with torrent sites. I'll say, um, are torrent sites illegal? Um, discuss. You know, and in actual fact, the torrent sites themselves are not illegal um, because the, the torrent site itself does not host the stuff on it. So the stuff that's been downloaded is not hosted on the torrent site at all. The torrent site is literally just an aggregator. It's just a directory um, that's telling your torrent client um, where else in the world, which IP address somewhere in the world is hosting that particular file that you're looking for. Um, and, and there are legal uses for torrents. You know, if, if you are making your own music and you want to ship it around, you could upload it and, you know, ship it around a torrent. So it, it's, it's, it's not the torrenting itself that's illegal. It's the files that you are torrenting that may or may not be illegal. So that's the distinction that they, they are looking for you to draw in that particular question if it comes up usually in a, in a paper somewhere. Identity theft, massive thing nowadays. They, they're saying in the book here that they're estimating that an identity is, is stolen every three seconds. It's probably even more than that. Because um, sometimes when the, these big insurance companies get hacked and everyone's um, information, all their um, ID numbers or social security numbers and addresses and everything gets stolen, they get stolen in, in mass. Millions of people's stuff gets stolen just in one hack. So I think it's probably more than one every three seconds on average. Okay, they talk about bandwidth theft, um, hot linking. Basically, if you've got a blog, instead of putting a picture on your own blog and serving the picture off your own website, i.e. you paying for the bandwidth, yeah, you just link to it somewhere else. Um, and then they got to pay for the bandwidth every time somebody loads that picture, right? So that's called hot linking. Not so much of an issue nowadays because bandwidth is so cheap. But back in the day, it used to be a bit more. Uh, and in fact, you got image um, serving companies that would say, store your images here with us and then link to them, you know, and you would pay for that service you know, because they would have cheap bandwidth. Not so much an issue nowadays. Hot linking, okay, stealing of wireless bandwidth. Um, so back in the day, there used to be this thing, and I suspect it probably still goes on now, called war driving. I don't know if you've heard of it before, um, war driving. Um, so you would basically just drive around in your car, especially in a city, uh, just looking for open, um, for open Wi-Fi. So it, you would just go in, find a Wi-Fi um, that had no password on it, and, it, and then just use it. 
Okay, and there was entire suites of software written for this. You could just literally uh, drive around and the software would mark where you were, the GPS coordinates, uh, and how many sort of open Wi-Fi points there were for you. So you could just cruise around and look for them. Nowadays, now that we've got fiber at home and uh, fiber in, in your office, the chance of this being a problem is, yes, the, obviously people are sitting on your network, shouldn't have them there, and you shouldn't have unsecured Wi-Fi, but it's not as much of an issue as it used to be. Um, Internet-related fraud scams, I'll let you have a look at that. You know, buying something and then a person doesn't deliver it for you. Um, all sorts of ways you can get scammed that you just got to be careful of, right? You can just look at that credit card fraud. Just be careful what you do with your credit card online. Um, a lot of that is obvious. I'll let you read that. Uh, internet attacks. Uh, I must admit, this is the first time I've ever heard of a semantic attack. Um, it probably happens. I can't imagine someone log busting all the way into your network just to change your documentation. And that would be silly. They, they're coming to steal your plans and steal your customers' information and things like that. They're not coming to change your stuff. You know, so I don't think that's as much of an issue as the other. It's a denial of service attack, that's a big one nowadays. Um, nowadays with all the uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, um, things that are coming in line, people connecting their fridges and their light bulbs to the Internet now, you know, with Philips Hue, um, their televisions get connected to the Internet. All these things get connected. Routers, that's a huge, huge one, um, get connected to the Internet. And, they've, and, and most of them have got a backdoor admin level password that the, that the manufacturer put into them. Um, and then people uh, look at the software, they work out what those are. And, and normally they're stupid in like admin, admin or admin and password one or something stupid like that. Um, and then the crims will build these massive botnets um, of literally fridges and light bulbs. Because remember that light bulb has a web browser inside of it. Okay, it's running a scaled down version of Linux usually. Um, all of these things have the fridge, the TV, Okay, they've got some sort of scaled down operating system inside them, usually includes a web browser because that's what they want to update stuff. And then what they'll do is they'll, they'll take all those devices, all the, 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 um, all the routers, all the light bulbs, all the television sets, all the fridges in the world, millions and millions, um, webcams, all sorts of things they will they, now that they own them because they can actually be able to log into them they, what they'll do is they will they will launch an attack on somebody okay and what they'll do is they'll instruct all of those devices um, to load a web page from a specific website simultaneously and of course very few web servers in the world can can take a million simultaneous inbound connections from all over the world Okay, so that's what they call a distributed denial of service attack, a DDoS. And so there are some of these massive botnets around at the moment, and again, that's going to get worse and worse. So that's denial of service attack, basically flooding somebody's server so that it can't provide service to legitimate users. A man in the middle attack, basically someone sitting in the middle, say between at your ISP or between you, 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 you busy. Um, th this is a problem in. In countries that have got like oppressive governments, Iran, China, <laughs> sorry, excuse me, where the government sort of runs the internet service providers, right? So they can put recording equipment at the service provider um, and, and that will record what, what it is that you're doing. Um, and that's what they call a man in the middle attack for obvious reasons. Somebody is sitting in the middle between you and wherever you're trying to communicate with, um, siphoning off all your data. Okay, so and, and then they can at their leisure go through and see what it's all about. So that's a man in the middle attack. Uh, backdoor, um, th that's malware that'll get installed on your machine. Okay, there's, uh, they call them rats or remote access trojan. And then basically your machine uh, opens up a port that somebody can connect to, and then they can view you through your webcam, listen to your microphone. Um, they can steal all the stuff any and basically they can do whatever you can do so whatever you you can do sitting on your machine they can do remotely um so it's a bit of a gnarly thing um a root kit root kit's a bit of an interesting thing a root kit is not like normal malware right normal malware runs on windows 
And if you've got an antivirus, you can normally, or an anti-malware program, you can normally find that malware. A rootkit, on the other hand, um, that's written, that, that's not Windows specific. A rootkit basically loads before Windows loads. Okay, so when you turn your machine on, the rootkit loads first, and then your operating system loads afterwards. So the rootkit has complete control. Okay, and it can detect if, you know, if something in Windows is trying to just trying to find it, and it'll just actively camouflage itself. Okay, so rootkits are notoriously difficult to get rid of. Um, and what they do is they use uh, what they call heuristic scanners for this. Um, they don't look for the rootkit itself because they're unable to. It, it, it's, it's that good at hiding. Um, they're looking at what it's doing. Okay, so if, if your machine suddenly starts doing something weird and there's no software on it that's actually doing that at that point in time, then they've got to think to themselves, oh, there's something that's invisible. It's there. We just can't see it. Okay, dark matter, right? Think of that in the universe. We know it's there because of its gravitational pull, but we can't see it. Okay, we can see its effect. Gravity, the fact that it's holding all the stars in, in, the, in the galaxies together, but we cannot see it. Okay, that's what a rootkit is. A rootkit is like dark matter. We know it's there. We just can't see it. Okay. Uh, siphoning, you can look at that. Once again, it's very rare. Okay, most people are going to bang a back door into your machine. Um, you know, they, 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 they're going to take that sort of thing, or 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 are going to do some sort of a denial of service attack, a brute force approach because it's cheap and easy. Okay. Botnets, I spoke about botnets earlier on, people taking over, specifically Internet of Things devices, fitness watches that you wear on your arm now, they're all very weakly secured because the manufacturer was very good at making the hardware, but they sucked hard when it came to writing the software to secure it. Okay, they didn't have experts in that field, um, security experts, and so they did stupid things. and. And those devices are all vulnerable now, all um, surveillance web cameras, um, like I said, fridges, TVs, light bulbs, all these things, uh, children's toys, baby monitors, all these things um, that are connecting to the internet now. Just believe it or not, people connect their toothbrush. You can get a toothbrush that connects to the internet. Um, I think I've probably told you before, there's a website called Internet of Shit. Dot com. Go and have a look at it. You'll see um, it's, it's, it's actually a bit tongue in cheek. This guy maintains a website of all the ridiculous things in the world that people connect to the Internet. Very interesting. OK, then we got a right to access, right to privacy. You can read through that. That's very, very interesting. Now, in today's world, you know, people are putting so much of this uh, information online, Facebook and social media sites. Um, and now you've got this whole sort of. Um, right to privacy, uh, you know, or do, does your government have a right to spy on you sort of thing. So you can read through all that. Um, safeguards against computer crimes, you can have a look at that. Often you find the question comes up, um, sort of that you, they want you to switch in and test, I'll say differentiate between a firewall um, and an antivirus package. You understand they are completely different things, right? A firewall is at the edge of your machine, right at the front, the network point. Um, and that is keeping all the ports closed, or it's looking to see what's coming in the various ports. Remember, you've got 64K ports, 65,536 ports on your, on your machine. Think of it as like a channel. It's a, it's a, it's a network channel, um, and different software uses different channels. Um, web uses port 80, for example. Um, mail uses uh, 25 and 110. Um, secure web uses 443. Um, so different protocols use different channels, and there's 64K of them. So uh, the firewall's job is to, to keep an eye on those, keep those ports closed or monitor what's coming in of them. Um, whereas antivirus and anti-malware, that's looking more at your software, you know, what's kind of on your machine already. Is there anything nefarious that's running as a Trojan or something like that on your machine? So make sure you understand the differences between between those uh, and also between a sort of a virus and malware, two completely uh, different things. So make sure you understand that. 
Uh, distributed computing power here on page 54, where I am now, section 5.7. Uh, that's quite a big thing nowadays. Funny enough, in this COVID epidemic, there was there's a couple of these um, projects that have been around for a long time. There's one called SETI at home, um, where you could donate some of your computer time uh, in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They would, um, they've got these radio telescopes that are listening for signals, and obviously it's way too much for them to process. So they would send you a chunk they would send it to your machine, a chunk of radio signal, um, and then your machine would would look for them. Okay, and so they connect, or, and you it's voluntary. So you would volunteer um, computer time, usually when you're not using it, when you're asleep, et cetera, et cetera. And it would be part of your uh, your desktop wallpaper it would be a piece of software that's running this in the background. Um, there's one called Folding at Home. Um, with, and that deals with sort of the folding of proteins, how proteins are structured. And and then, and now that's had a massive resurgence. In fact, I was reading an article uh, a few days ago that folding at home is now the largest supercomputer in the, on the globe. It's, it's it's bigger than any supercomputer in the world, and that's just from Joe Average, you and me, donating power um, into this distributed machine. And basically, they're using it to try and um, work out uh, different methods of attacking this COVID virus. And of course, now people have a vested interest in putting their machine power, volunteering machine power in there. Um, and it was um, exaflops, exaflops of power. It's a monster, absolutely monstrous, the amount of power that, that they've now got at their disposal for this as a massive global supercomputer. Decision-making, this is a big thing now coming in, obviously with machine learning and artificial intelligence um, and the ability to crunch big data, they call it sort of big data. Um, that's an emerging field. If you're getting into IT, obviously big data is gonna be a big, big thing. Um, crunching this massive, immense amounts of data into sort of meaningful business, meaningful information. Okay, so decision making, that's becoming a big thing now, uh, the use of computers and decision making, particularly with AI and machine learning. Um, okay, the evolution of social networking and the effect on society, you can read through that as well. Uh, information overload, like I said to you before, um, fake news is another thing. Um, just people that profess to be experts in the field just um, put out absolute trash. Um, and then there's there's sheeple that will just blindly follow what they say. You know, there's, there's been, and in fact, now this COVID epidemic once again has brought a couple of those to light. Like some person said that, oh, 5G has caused um, COVID, and then you get the sheeple that are now going around. So they've had this big problem in Europe um, where people are setting fire um, to the cell phone towers because they, they believe that 5G is is kind of where the covid came from and 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 there's some mir miracle cures as well you know that people are just being scammed into buying to do with covid there always be people that try and take advantage um of of the weak and the dumb okay don't be one of those people okay um availability of personal information you can read through that there what happens if your stuff gets stolen Giving or voluntarily giving away all your information. You've got to be a bit careful of that. Um, I, me and myself personally, I, I don't have any social media accounts. Really, I have no Facebook account or anything like that. Um, I'm just not prepared to be their client. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think I might have faded out there. I got some messages that came out that said I've been bumped out of the meeting, but it looks like I might be back again now. Okay, um, 5.9 on uh, page 57, they talk about a GUI. A GUI is something that's buried in your machine. Okay, um, a, a global unique identifier. Uh, it's a bit like a MAC address, or they, in fact, they were using the, your machine's MAC address. We all know that a MAC address is a unique hard-coded um, address that's built into your network card. You can't change it. Uh, you can spoof it. You, there's software that'll spoof your MAC address, um, but, it, it, but it is hard-coded. You can't do anything with it. Um, and 
You'll find that certain software like Windows and that sort of thing, they will use this GUID um, as part of its licensing. That's how they know that your machine um, has been licensed, the, the particular license they attach it to your machine. Um, so that GUID, but they can also use it um, for other things. Like I said, they actually used it to track the creator um, of, of the Melissa virus and prosecute them because they could actually determine from some documents as to the GUID of the machine that made the document and he had it. So that was it. And then it's just a small thing on file sharing there. Okay, so that's it for this. Uh, let me just turn off the recording.